Good morning. Um, my name is Curtis Abarz, and I'm the CEO of EndoQuest Robotics. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be part of the surgery and minimal invasive surgery space for the last 40 years. I know I don't look it. I started when I was 10, maybe. Uh, but you know, saying all that, I, I was always asking myself, what if, um, as an engineer? Um, and open surgery um, was an amazing innovation, but there's issues with open surgery. So I was fortunate enough to be part of the stapling, uh, surgical stapling uh, platform that was developed by US Surgical uh, in the early 80s. Laparoscopy came around. Again, I was very fortunate to be part of that in the late 80s and early 90s, developed a lot of instrumentation to allow laparoscopic surgery to happen. People don't realize that. Without industry, these procedures wouldn't be happening. We were there with surgeons, hand in hand, figuring out how we would do a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So again, very fortunate. In the last 15 years, I've been part of the robotic evolution. Uh, my company, uh, SurgiQuest uh, build their business uh, on robotics. We had 95% of our revenue, $50 million in revenue in 40 countries was based on robotic surgery. We sold that technology to ConMed. But then I became the CEO of Verb Robotics, which was a, a joint venture between Johnson & Johnson and Google, a dream job, having two giants coming together to develop a platform. Um, and we sold that JV to Johnson & Johnson, and then I became the CEO of an awesome company called Endo EndoQuest Robotics, which is focused on endoluminal robotics. So continuing on the what if question, on all of our minds that, that have been part of this endeavor is, what if you didn't have to make incisions? What if you could do surgery through natural orifices? And I believe me, if, if this audience was full of surgeons, every one of them would be asking that question because that is a dream of ours. Go where the disease is without an incision, treat it early, effectively with less, in, uh, less invasiveness, allow the surgeons to go home, fa uh, patients to go home faster, and, and, and just improve quality outcomes. So I, I put this slide on because it's very rare where you see these type of improvements in all categories. There's no questions patients would benefit from not having a scar. There's no question the physicians would rather have a procedure that only takes third of the time, a much less invasive and much more effective. From a provider and payer standpoint, when was the last time you, you would have all the pieces of the equation come together from a standpoint of faster recovery, faster procedure, better outcomes? Um, so we really are excited about this dream of mine, or what if, and, and I, I hope I don't have to ask that question anymore because I think this is final what if answer for me. Um, what is EndoQuest Robotic? It is a robot. You're gonna see a lot of people come today and yesterday and talk about robots. To me, my, in my eyes, robot is something like an intuitive. You have a physician console, you have a uh, patient card or a robot, and then you have a tower. Um, we make these devices ourselves. Uh, as a matter of fact, what you see here is our second generation product, which is uh, gonna be used for a clinical study. Uh, we make it in, in Boston. Um, uh, we have three facilities, one in Boston, uh, one in Houston, and, and a large facility in, in, in South Korea. Um, and, and truly, uh, what, what I would say is that um, it is enabling. Uh, that word enabling is used a lot in our, in our space. To me, enabling is allowing for you to do something you weren't able to do before. So we do this through uh, a, a, what we call an overtube. So you first insert the overtube inside, in, in trans, transanally or transorally, transvaginally, and then once you get to the lesion, then you, you dock that on the robot, uh, and then from there, you have instrumentation that will be inserted with a camera that's flexible. Um, so all the dimensions are there. It's, it's very, you know, I would say it's a small footprint from standpoint of size. Um, from a market standpoint, sky is the limit. Um, there's not a single time where I've come down a podium conversation or a presentation and different surgeons from different specialties would approach me and say, well, can I use that in thoracic space between the ribs? You know, can I, can I use it in urology doing, bladder, you know, going, doing prostate through bladder? I mean, you, you can imagine their, 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 their minds are going crazy when they can finally have a platform can allow them to do certain things that they weren't able to do before. We are focused on four areas, transanal, transoral, transvaginal, and then transumbilical. For us, those are 
low-hanging fruit. These are things that we're very familiar with. There's an unmet need, and, and, and the, the numbers are out, you know, huge. I mean, big, big, big procedural numbers and big, big, big marketing numbers. So for us, it's just the beginning. Again, this, I truly believe this platform has no limitation. So we are um, we're going to be starting our study at the beginning of next year. Uh, it's a transanal study uh, with 60 patients with 30-day follow-up. Uh, we've done a number of patients outside the U.S. With, with very good data, and our hope is to be able to um, uh, get a de novo 510K uh, sometime in, 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 in 2025. So this is a procedure. We're going to walk you through a video of a procedure of an EST um, done is a simulation of an ESD, but here we get to use the Indoluminal Robotic System by Indoquest. The Indoquest Robotics Open Physician Console contains a graphics user interface, or a GUI, which provides useful information to the physician during a procedure. In the upper left, the overtube roll, flex, and translation is displayed. On the middle left and the middle right panels, instrument details, position, and status are displayed that includes user feedback information on foot pedals, finger clutches, and hand control devices. In the top part of the lower left, we see the video scope flex and translation. And in the lower left and the lower right, we see a three-dimensional representation of the system instruments in space. Right now I have two instruments set up. I have a grasper in my left hand and I have a hook in my right hand. And we're gonna start out by just uh, identifying a, a pretend lesion. And what we really wanna do is demonstrate some of the features that you know the robotic platform gives us and uh, some of the precision that we can get uh, with dissection with the robot. Go ahead and insert, go ahead and push into the tissue, keep going, and just inject a little bit. It looks like I've got a lift on all sides of the demarcated area, so we'll stick with this. Go ahead and retract. One of the beautiful things that we can do with uh, two hands is we can really achieve good tension and counter tension, and here I'm just gonna kind of lift upward. The entire goal of the ESD is to get an R0 resection, and this is coming along quite nice. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to get the specimen out, putting a Roth net through that instrument channel, and then I'll pass it to the Roth net and it'll pull it out. Now this is a needle driver on my left side, and, and the needle driver on my right side is gripping that uh, suture actually quite nicely. It grips it hard enough that I can really handle the needle quite well, but it's delicate enough that I can handle the mucosal tissue without doing any damage. You know, one thing that we've learned with basic surgical technique is that it really is important to get it just right. Technique matters. And here, by picking up a suture. So the last piece, when you see a suture uh, inside a lumen, an ability to throw a knot, an ability to be able to, be able to close a lesion, that, that is like eye-opening for any surgeon in any specialty. So I just want to make sure you guys had a chance to see it. We talked about our timeline, very detailed robots, <laughs> difficult with the FDA, the V&V process, and all the work you got to do to get it there. It's, it's, it's probably the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, this is my second time at it, so hopefully we are successful. Um, we, we're planning to do the studies in four centers, uh, Harvard Medical School with Chris Thompson, um, Mayo Clinic, uh, Cleveland Clinic, and then at Van Hale. Um, those four sites are already are ready to go, and, and we've been well-trained. Um, for me, it's about partnerships. We have a, a relationship with Harvard Medical School and AirCAD uh, in France developing upper GI procedures, which is our next target. You gotta start doing that as you develop in your current platform. So that's been really going well. We have robots in both facilities where they're working with us on procedure development. Um, we also signed two uh, agreements uh, recently, one with uh, Vernamed with our simulation and training. I believe in robotics, the only way you're gonna be successful is through training and simulation because you do new procedures 
uh, and you need to train them on a new system. You need to have those tools to be able to be successful. And then proximity, which will give us the multi-purpose uh, digital OR as a, as a tool. Um, I couldn't do it without my scientific advisory board. I'm blessed to have the gods of surgery in, in, as part of it. I don't think it's ever been where you have five people with this type of background come together as to scientific advisory board, and that's speaking volumes about what we're doing and why they're so excited about it. Uh, I have an amazing team, all with robotic background. I will tell you, if you're running a robotic company, you need to have people that have run robots before. Without it, you're going to take a lot longer. But I've been blessed to have an amazing team that's been uh, delivering robotic platforms for many years. Um, and then again, we are, we are ahead, and nobody else is doing endoluminal surgery robotically. You know, it is the future of MIS. We have amazing technology and platform, huge market. We have a freedom to operate, right to use. IP is king in this space, you know it, and we have to make sure that we have that. And then finally, again, when would you have all four uh, stakeholders addressed in any platform? Thank you.